Our second scripture reading today comes from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke's Gospel tells of the particular good news for the poor and for the outsider. The passage you will hear is set in the middle of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, where he is a vulnerable traveler, dependent on the hospitality of others. We see him doing the kingdom work of sharing meals, both with marginalized people and with religious authorities, often channeling a prophetic voice in his challenges to those in power. In our passage, Jesus is at dinner in the home of a religious leader, observing the social behavior of both guests and hosts. This text is sometimes dismissed as unimportant social commentary, but to do that is to miss the radical nature of what Jesus is teaching and to avoid the difficulty of following the instructions that Jesus gives us. Listen now for the word of God. On one occasion when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come to you and say, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return, and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This ends the reading. Thanks be to God. As creative organizer of youth ministry here at St. Mark, I am called to walk alongside the young people in our congregation, to listen to them, to love them, connecting them to their church community, teaching them to talk theologically, empowering them to participate authentically in a vibrant life of faith. Children and teens are often marginalized or tokenized in church life, as they are in other arenas. And I hear them expressing their bewilderment at the world adults have allowed to be, frustrated that they lack a seat at the grown-up table to make the changes the world needs mystified by the distance between God's way and the American way. No one calls out hypocrisy with brutal accuracy like a teenager, and we adults deserve an earful of it. We are trying to do right by them here, but there is much work still to be done. Ask any young person that you love about the climate crisis or gun violence, and you will hear truth. But on a lighter note, I have to tell you that the young people of this congregation are thoughtful and funny and wise. They love each other deeply. They have shaped my own faith in beautiful ways. These younger humans are not the future of the church. They are the present. They are here now. May we recognize them for the present they are. And also their great company. Last Sunday, we held a prom-themed end-of-summer youth group celebration at their request. We went to the concert on the green featuring a Queen cover band. We wore the greatest outfits, if I can tell you myself. There were ball gowns, top hats, Freddie Mercury-inspired coats, and vintage dresses. There are pictures on the board outside you can see after worship. In planning the evening's events, I was aware that a group of teenagers, no matter how wonderful, dressed in their most fancy costumes and in a celebratory mood might attract unkindness, and they did. 
For even though we arrived at the venue early, the crowds had arrived earlier than us, and we had to find some room on the grass to squeeze into, as it was plain to see that people had claimed larger areas than they would need. There was enough space for everyone, but it was going to take some goodwill to get everyone a seat. A woman offered to move her blanket to make room for us, but the people beside her were upset, concerned that we would take up some of their space. These arbiters of grass were openly rude and insulting, loudly muttering about teenagers, making it clear that we were not welcome. We sat down in the space offered, but the anger of our neighbors made us tense and quiet, hurt and ashamed. Through the grace of God, aided by Shane, my husband's excellent eyesight, we saw a spot open up a short distance in front of us, and we moved there quickly. There, 15 feet from where we had been unwelcome, people scooched their butts and blankets to accommodate us, asking the story behind our party attire. The youth played with babies and a puppy, and a kind man offered his hand to help the teens in ball gowns as they squeezed between chairs, a gesture that rang in my head with the words from our scripture, friend, move up higher. Now, I'm not interested in assigning guilt, the people who were upset with us, they had their own fears and life experiences. They are beloved children of God. May they have abundant grass and be at peace. <laughs> what drew me to tell this story today was not to enlist your sympathy, not to provide a social commentary, but rather to share the gospel experience of a reversal, from stepping from hostility to hospitality. We felt the goodness of God's welcome, the joy and relief of being seen, wanted, and loved, especially bright following the previous darkness. Likewise, in Luke 14, Jesus is at table, is calling for a reversal, challenging privileged, powerful religious folks to shift from an ethic of scarcity to one of abundance, to move willingly from their seats of power to stances of humility, to do the work to include those who are easier to exclude. Here we see an iteration of the concept of God's upside-down kingdom, where the powerful are brought down from their thrones and the lowly are lifted up. Now, some passages in the Bible can be confusing or confounding. This passage is not like that. This is classic Jesus stuff. When I read it, inner teenage me says, yes, this is true. We who follow Jesus should give up our seats. We should distribute power more equitably and fairly. We must feed the poor and the marginalized. And then powerful, privileged adult me gets going, making excuses and negotiating. Jesus, do you know how hard it is to do what you're asking? Do you know what I stand to lose? I'm a nice white lady, and things are working out okay for me. I feel seen here in this scripture and not in a good way. Jesus noticed what humans were up to at the banquet table. We did it then, and we're doing it now. Through our desperation for security, we hoard power and possessions. We accept what is rather than what ought to be, because we are safe here in our seats at the table. We allow our unearned privilege to tell us that we deserve the best seat. We resist walking humbly in examining and relinquishing our privilege, sometimes even refusing to engage the idea of privilege at all. Our seat at the table is what protects us from being on the menu, and scarcity tells us that forfeiting power is a death sentence. We've taught ourselves to survive, to look out for ourselves and our own. We dodge vulnerability by living transactional lives, hosting only those who can repay the favor, refusing to engage in messy relationships with those who cannot reciprocate. We avoid at all costs the frightening prospect of needing each other. And this mindset of scarcity, it's so human and so understandable. Our instincts for survival have led us to put our trust in things that are not God, in the myth of fierce individualism, in bootstrapping narratives of making ourselves, and our capitalist, racist, patriarchal systems that work well enough for those who speak and look and love and worship in acceptable ways. But God's way is different. To paraphrase the prophet Jeremiah in our first reading, just look at this mess. 
Like the people of his time, we too have gone after worthless things and defiled the land. We have forsaken our God, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for ourselves, cracked cisterns that hold no water. The scriptures invite us to be God's people over and over, called to a new way of justice and generosity. And well, how is that going? Have you seen the news? We're still stubbornly doing it our way, destroying the planet and our neighbors in the process. Of course, our teenagers are feeling betrayed by the church and other grown-up institutions. Every day, new horrible headlines are churned out, driven in part by the ways in which we operate out of scarcity and self-interest. We have melted the glaciers. We have set fire to the lungs of the world. We have protected our guns instead of our children. We have failed to see the child of Mary, the Son of God, in the faces of immigrant and refugee children. We have criminalized the poor. We have told the outsider to stay outside. We have told the sick that they will be deported, and on and on. And when we, the church, have objected to these evils, have we done enough to change them? Have we forfeited our power or risked our status? Just look at this mess. Where is the justice? Where is the generosity? We cry for a shift from our way to God's way, children, teens, and adults alike. So in the midst of all of this, how do we cultivate the faith of teenagers, of nuns and duns, those with no religion, and those who have written off faith entirely? We show them that Jesus is calling us to a different way of being in this world. We are called to justice, to the solidarity, the kingdom of being with, loving, and knowing our neighbors. We are not tasked with charity, but with breaking bread together, of recognizing one another as equals across all human barriers and categories. We belong to each other, we tell them. We belong to God, we sing together. We teach them that to share a meal is to be seen, known, and loved. We model and make space for vulnerability for walking humbly with God. While vulnerability risks rejection, it is only through vulnerability that we get to love. We tell them that this walk with God does not promise safety or respectability or ease. Even though we wish we could give them those and more. But God's way promises abundant life and is the path to justice and joy. How do we build in the young a love for this community of faith? We give credit where it's due, and we show them the way. We introduce them to the people, many of you here in this congregation, who are diving into the work of justice and staying there. Feeding, visiting, healing, housing, listening, loving. We empower our youth to go and do likewise. How do you heal damage and hurt to restore the broken shalom of our world? We embrace and extend Jesus' invitation to a messier life, a different kind of mess, a beautiful mess. We give up our exalted seats. We invite those in who have been disillusioned, powerless, and we dine together all here through the mess of communion together in this mess of community. We leave behind crumbs of bread and drops of juice. Together in blessed communion, we redefine abundance as enough for all, enough to share one bread for the one body of the kingdom of God. Then we go out into the world and do likewise. Amen. <laughs>